Hi, this is Stephen from Own or Disown. Now, last year we saw the Aero 15 launch with the GTX 1060 and the GTX 1070 Max-Q. Now, for the RTX release, they decided to keep the same chassis, but give us a couple of extra bonuses for free. We still have the all aluminium chassis build with the back held in place with torque screws. Speaker grills fired down from the front and air intakes are here. Now, the back panel is light, but it's still very rigid. You still have the same 94 watt hour battery, which is good for six hours, 45 minutes. And you have an open SATA PCI Express SSD slot here. Instead of the previous 512 gigabyte SSD boot drive, you do get a one terabyte Intel 9060P, which is great. You do have two RAM slots, but my unit only came with one Samsung stick of 16 gigabytes DDR4, 2666 megahertz. Now this is where you have to make sure you read the full specs before you order. At the moment, there are six SKUs ranging from $2,400 to $4,000, depending on if you want a 2070 Max Q or 2080 Max Q, either a full HD panel or 4K panel, or even the i7 or 9 CPU. Currently, only the high-end SKUs have dual channel RAM, but Gigabyte has told me that they will be offering more SKUs with this feature in the lower price bracket. Now, you lose a lot of performance going single channel, so I really do encourage you to purchase through a system integrator until these new SKUs become available. As previous, we have two fans and two shared heat pipes, blowing hot air out of the back through two small heat sinks. As for the Wi-Fi, we have the Intel 9560, which is great. At £4.11 ounces and 1.8 cm thick, it is very portable, and with the aluminium build, one would expect the chassis to get actually quite warm. You can see where hot air is drawn in through the keyboard, so the corresponding key areas are nice and cool. The centre of the keyboard is warmer, you know for sure, but it's not bad. Most of the heat is at the back near the hinge, which is away from the user. The palm rest areas I would just class as warm, but this is using max fans, which I use for all of my testing. So if you lower the fan speed, expect the, the chassis to get a little bit warmer. The underside is a different story, of course. At about 53 degrees Celsius, it is probably too warm to game on your lap. On the right hand side, you have the UHS-2 SD card reader, which is good for 300 megabytes per second. Thunderbolt 3, two USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports, and the power jack at the back. On the left, there is still space for a RJ45 port, a USB 3.1 Gen 2 port, HDMI 2.0, USB uh, C 3.1 with DisplayPort 1.4 support and a combo headphone mic jack. Now, if you are after a thin and light gaming laptop that doesn't scream gamer, the Aero 15 should be on your shortlist. Sure, it's not as sexy as the Razer 15 or even the Zephyrus S, but remember, it has that fast SD card reader and Ethernet port. No need for any dongles, and I think it still looks pretty nice. The Gigabyte logo lighting uh, lights up right on the panel, and the per RGB keyboard lighting is very nice. The 1080p IPS panel is made by LG and offered reasonable color accuracy for content creation, but it is more geared to those looking to spend more time gaming. Now, the 4K SKUs may be more suitable if you want a better panel for photo or video work. In my ghosting test, I would say it performs slightly ahead of my Razer 15. I'm also very impressed with the very low level of light bleed. Gigabyte maintains the uniform slim bezels around the side and the top of the screen, which makes movies and games look great. The hinge is pretty stiff and the panel itself is fairly rigid. Unfortunately, the webcam is still at the bottom and is, you know, is only suitable for occasional use. This is what a webcam looks and sounds like. The keyboard has a decent distance of travel and the feedback is pretty good when you press the keys. You do have a separate number pad as well without making the keyboard any smaller. My main criticism is with the max fan function on the, which is on the escape key. It is just too close to the sleep key that you know for several times I inadvertently put the computer to sleep whilst playing a game. This fan button needs to be moved over to the right hand side. Now the palm rests don't feel sharp and are comfortable. And finally, we have Windows Precision drivers for the touchpad. This makes it so much more pleasing to use compared to their previous Elan touchpads. Unfortunately, I have been told that the drivers are not backwards compatible to the last gen Aero 15. The main software on the laptop is their AI and their control center. 
The AI is in its early days and much depends on what information is stored in the data centers of the Microsoft Azure servers. Now, fortunately, you can easily turn this off or if you prefer, use AI Edge to keep all of the data on your local machine. Now, I did test this thoroughly in every benchmark and program I use. And with single channel, uh, single channel RAM, there was no benefit whatsoever, not even with the AI Edge. And I was repeatedly running the same programs and tests. Switching to dual channel RAM, I tested AI Cloud and AI Off only. Now, some games seemed to benefit while some did not. One game that did benefit though was Fortnite. You can hear the fans actually ramp up when the AI is applied and the frame rates increases with it. And this is one thing you must remember. The AI cloud setting controls the fan speeds and the keyboard lighting. Using their Fusion software, you can configure various lighting effects or each key lighting individually. But as soon as you switch to the AI cloud, all of this goes away as it is configured you know, by itself to use the keys which are used in whatever game you are playing, such as what you see here in Overwatch. But what makes this uh, very frustrating is that it doesn't revert to your chosen RGB lighting once the game is closed. You have to manually go in and change it again using the Fusion software. Now this is going to drive people crazy. And you know, given the questionable benefit of the AI anyway, people are literally going to leave it switched off. Now hopefully this can be fixed via an update. The speakers are average really. They're okay for general use, but at 65 decibels, they aren't super loud. Especially when you consider that the Max fans produce about 51 decibels of noise. And believe me, you need Max fans on when you're gaming. Gigabyte gives you a lot of fan control options. Now, whether you want to create your own fan curve or use quiet mode, if you, do, if you don't want any fan noise whatsoever so when you're doing basic tasks, or just have them run at a fixed percentage rate of your choosing. One useful piece of software is that Gigabyte lets you stop the battery charging at a certain, certain percentage to prolong its lifespan. And of course they have their smart update utility, which is a good central way to keep track of required updates. I noticed that Gigabyte had slightly overvolted the CPU by 10 millivolts, which I thought was rather strange, you know, considering how thermally restrained, restrained these thin laptops are. Its base multi-core CD bench score was 1092 points, which is normal for this i7 8750H CPU. I never read too much into this as it's such a short test though. Once we run Heaven in the background and uh, do repeated runs of CD bench, it drops to 696 points. And, and this is about middle of the road. You can see here the settings I use for all of my overclock tests. I have the CPU undervolted by 120 millivolts and the clock speed set to 3500 megahertz. I use these settings to keep temperatures in check and to reduce the power throttle. Now rerunning the Cinebench multitask test, we now get 738 points. Now before I launch into my test results, let me explain what I have here. And by the way, I share this with you via a link in the description. So I have the games on the left hand side, in fact all the applications. So there's quite a few games, Cinebench, Handbrake, some CPU tests, the V-Ray benchmarks are here, I have those. And this is all uh, running uh, dual channel. Uh, but not overclocked and below it I have the same set for the uh, CPU set for 3500 megahertz and a uh, 125 millivolt actually uh, uh, undervolt. So um, I show you the uh, clock rates of the average clock rate of the CPU, the, uh, the max uh, boost clock of the CPU, same for the watts, uh, average and max temperature and the same of course for the uh, GPU as well and then of course as we go along I show you uh, information regarding the uh, the AI cloud, minimum and average, and various quality settings going across the board. And then uh, further to the right, I actually even show you um, GTX 1070 Max-Q rate test. You can do a quick comparison yourself. And uh, of course here we've got the CPU tests with the AI on and off. And of course, I replicate most of the results the same again when we uh, do the overclock. So uh, we've got that here. Now, if you look at the temperature from stock uh, max fans, uh, we've got the CPU average temperature here, averaging 82 degrees, maxing around about 90. Of course, you know, it was taken down a lot by the Cine bench there, which is short. So take that out of the equation, and you'll see that the temperatures are pretty high. You know, using the 94s usually. Now with the um, of course, max fan and the undervolt and so forth, the, the temperatures are much less. You know, so from that 90, it's down to 82, 
but you can see there was only one um, in Assassin's Creed where it uh, spiked into like 93, but the rest were uh, much more, much better. Now the GPU um, clock rate, interestingly when it was uh, overclocked, the average clock rate of 1300 was about the same, but the boost clock average was certainly a lot bigger. So that's what helps in the frame rate. And uh, the temperatures come down as well. The average uh, GPU uh, temperature comes down quite a bit. Um, and also the max temperature comes down quite a bit too. And this is because of that CPU underclock. So it's definitely worth doing. Using Handbrake to encode a four gigabyte video file, the Aero 15 did it in 34 and a half minutes. And that was with AI off. This was slower than the Zephyrus S and to be frank, slower than most laptops with the same CPU. But this was because of the CPU only averaged 2,938 MHz. But applying my throttle stop settings, this shaved off five and a half minutes. Applying the AI feature actually took longer. So until they get their algorithm sorted out, you're best just doing this uh, boost yourself. In my Adobe Premiere Pro test, we, we see much the same, but the CPU did average higher at 3,140 MHz. Applying my throttle stop settings, we see a nice improvement of just over 10%. Now, interestingly, using CUDA acceleration uh, for the RTX 2070 Max-Q, it didn't seem to offer any benefit over the ten, uh, GTX 1070 Max-Q. Many will want to take advantage of the RTX uh, Turing cores to accelerate ray tracing programs, so I test this using V-Ray Benchmark. These are times in seconds for both the CPU and the GPU, and as you can see, using the AI negatively affects performance. I include the time for a full powered RTX 2070 uh, and at 57 seconds, this is much quicker. But since a GTX 1080 takes two minutes, you can really see the benefit what these RTX cards bring to the table in, you know, in such applications. Now on the gaming. The max overclock on the 2070 Max here was 171 on the core and 558 on the memory. So in all of my overclock tests, I use this plus the throttle stop setting I showed earlier. In all cases, I used AI off and a max fan. Assassin's Creed Odyssey is a taxing game. Here we have it at uh, ultra high settings. The CPU averages 89 degrees with peak at 92 and the GPU averages 83 degrees. Using the inbuilt benchmark, you can see there is always a very low minimum frame rate. I didn't actually feel this in the game while playing though. You're not going to get close to 144 at 1080p though. Overclocking really did help though, pushing the very high settings to 66 FPS. So here we have Battlefield 1 Ultra Settings DX12. Now do note I have 125% scaling here. Overclocked is on the left and stock is on the right. And as you can see, not only do we get a higher frame rate, but the temperatures on the CPU and the GPU are less using my overclock settings. The GPU is cooler because the, cool, uh, the CPU is cooler and that helps bring the whole temperatures down. Of course, if you use the more typical 100% scaling, your frame rates will be higher, but even still, the minimums are good and overclocking really does help. If you really want to max out those frame rates, you can still do that with decent quality settings. Let's give you an idea on ray tracing in Battlefield 5, what it looks like and the kind of performance you can expect. Here is ultra settings, and typically you will see in the mid 40s to low 50s. Now move away where there are no reflections, then the frame rate will go up. At high settings, we do get a decent bump up to the mid 50s, and even at medium settings, we go up to the mid 60s, and I think it looks just as good, certainly if you are dashing around fast. Ray tracing is so dependent on what reflections are going on and how much smoke effects are being you know, displayed on the screen. Here I have the system overclocked and still get in the mid 40s. This is with ultra settings on a map with loads and loads of reflections. The arrow plays it well though, and if you drop down quality settings, you can make ray tracing very playable. As you can see, with my overclock settings, the temperatures are perfectly fine. Here is Battlefield 5 using DX11 ultra settings, overclocked on the left and stock on the right. Different maps, but what I want you to take away from this is that with my overclock settings, the CPU is able to actually pull even more watts and maintain a higher clock speed. Now adjusting to lower quality settings does improve frame rates, but nothing drastic. Overclocking at ultra settings brings us close to the high preset level. Here is Far Cry 5 using ultra settings without my overclock. The CPU touches 91 degrees and hovers around the 35 to 40 watt mark. We get an average of 83 FPS and solid frame rates. Decreasing quality settings gives marginal improvements and you know overclocking helps boost it by about 5%. Witcher 3 is still a very popular game, so here we have it at ultra settings. Overclocked, again on the left and stock on the right. Immediately you can see uh, what, that we get a nice bump in frame rate, 
but also a reduction in CPU temperature. You know, you've got to like that combination. Still, if you are seeking triple digit frame rates, then you will need to drop to high settings. Rainbow Six Siege at ultra settings. This laptop is perfect for, for pushing frame rates above the refresh rate easily in this game. Indeed, using the inbuilt benchmark, we seem to hit a CPU bottleneck and stuck around about the 180 FPS mark. Ghost Recon Wildlands at older settings is tough, but, but it's playable. This is at stock, so the CPU can get a little bit toasty. Now, if you are seeking high, high frame rates here, then you will definitely have to reduce quality settings, only low breaking the 100 FPS barrier. Fortnite, using epic settings, we have overclocked on the left and stock on the right. We see a huge improvement in performance when overclocked. This is with the AI off and uh, the max fans. Big increase in frame rate, but also the CPU is running so much cooler. I'm telling you, with these settings, this laptop is a beast. Remember though, you do need to get that dual channel RAM. So here's what we get when we lower the quality settings. It scales very well, and if you're screaming for high frame rates, it's definitely possible here. PUBG Ultra settings at stock. Max fans, of course. The CPU still gets pretty warm, but you get solid uh, average frame rates. I did see the occasional dip at Ultra, but at high or, or below, it was seen, you know, much less and it was perfectly fine. Here we have Rise of Tomb Raider DX12, very high settings. It plays very well, but the CPU still goes into the low 90s. Dropping down quality settings does improve the frame rate nicely. But for me, overclocking and capping that CPU clock is the way to go. You will definitely get a cooler temperature and a good 10% improvement in frame rate. Now, Shadow of the Tomb Raider at the highest settings still delivers frame rates in the 70s. But overclock it and we get the same frame rates as dropping down to the high settings. If you are seeking triple digit frame rates here, even low won't get you there. Finally, Time Spy. 6,753 points when overclocked is not that far from a GTX 1080, which surprised me. So to conclude, I would have to say that the Aero 15 X9 is, is a very good laptop, but you need to put some work into it. If you are the type of person who opens the box and wants everything to be hunky-dory straight away, then you might be, get a little bit frustrated. You know, the AI alters the fan speeds, it alters the keyboard lighting, so you need to know that right away. At the moment, you're probably best just leaving it all off. You must also make sure that you have two sticks of RAM, otherwise, you will be leaving a lot of performance on the table. Now, with its precision trackpad, its UHS-2 SD card reader and two easily accessible M.2 slots, it's a great laptop to use on the go and handle large files. The cooling still isn't the best, but you do get full fan control, which allows you to have zero fan noise if you are in an office. And when you want to push it hard, you can use my settings to not only give you killer frame rates, but also to keep the thermals in check. Now make sure to click that link in the description showing all of my test results. And if you are new to my channel, please be sure to subscribe. See you next time. Bye.